This podcast is for general informational educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of PHM from Pittsburgh. I am still your host, Dr. Tony Tarcici. For those of you who are new, I'm a MedPeach trained pediatric hospitalist here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh in the Paul C. Gaffney Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine. For those of you who are not new, welcome back. You know, we've been coming to you since October of 2016, going on eight years now where we talk about different aspects of pediatric hospital medicine, that sometimes the content specifications, sometimes different topics that arise. Uh, and we are back again with another good episode. So as always, remember, courtesy of the University of Pittsburgh, we have free CME. Uh, click at the link at the bottom of the description of the podcast to get it. Um, and we are here talking about something. Now, as you know, time to time, I pick topics on things that I see as I'm taking care of children at Pittsburgh. Uh, and this is something I've seen. And so uh, gastroparesis, we haven't done a ton of GI on the podcast, but we are going to try to cover pediatric gastroparesis. So we needed an expert to really help us understand this topic. And luckily, we were fortunate enough to find one who was kind enough to give up their time. So I'm going to introduce you to her. So Dr. Viba Sood, um, is our expert. She received her initial medical training in India and moved to the United States to complete pediatric residency at Brookdale University Hospital Center in Brooklyn, New York. She practiced as a general pediatrician for a few years, later pursuing pediatric gastroenterology fellowship at Golisano Children's Hospital in Rochester, New York. Upon graduating, she joined as an assistant professor at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C., where she developed an interest in gastrointestinal motility disorders and moved to Cincinnati Children's Hospital for advanced fellowship training in gastrointestinal motility disorders. Dr. Sood is currently the medical director of pediatric neurogastroenterology and motility program at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. She has experience in the evaluation and management of children with complex GI motility, functional gastrointestinal disorders, feeding and aerodigestive disorders. She's involved in multidisciplinary colorectal bowel management program, taking care of patients with medically refractory constipation, anorectal malformations, and Hirschsprung's disease. And now you know why there was nobody better to talk to us about this. So Dr. Sood, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, Viva, we, before we start, we have to do our disclosures for our conflict of interest statements because it's a CME podcast. I will go first and kick it out to you. Uh, I was on an advisory board for the Sanofi Corporation to increase uh, meningococcal vaccination rate in immunocompromised patients, uh, which should have no bearing on what we're talking about. Uh, and now your turn, Viva. I have no disclosures either. All right. Now, so, Viva, as you heard, and, you know, you, uh, uh, we've worked together before on service. You know me and I know you. But this is, to me, it seemed, and we discussed this to coming on the show, I have just been seeing more pediatric gastroparesis than I remember seeing in my career, and I thought we should talk about it. I guess we can start there. And uh, do you... Do you agree? Am I right? Or am I just, you know, uh, for some reason biased? Maybe I had a couple of weeks where I just saw a bunch of patients with it and that was it. Uh, but it, are we seeing more pediatric gastroparesis than in the past? So, yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question. And this is a question, you know, we in our GI world are also aspiring to answer. To answer your question uh, in a right context, uh, most of the data from gastroparesis has been acquired from adults. And unfortunately, due to lack of published epidemiological studies and lack of normative data in pediatric patients, the exact true incidence and prevalence of gastroparesis in children is not known. To answer your question, you 
you are right, you are seeing increased rate of hospitalizations for pediatric patients with gastroparesis. There was one study which was done uh, from year 2004 to 2013, which collected uh, pediatric hospital database uh, for patients about uh, approximately about 4,000 patients of pediatric patients were kind of analyzed and they found that in those years from 2004 to 2013, there was increased rate of hospitalization for these patients. And what they also recorded was there was significant increase in the number of diagnoses uh, for patients with gastroparesis and the number increased dramatically from 170 to almost about 700 patients in those 10 years. They also noted that there was approximately about 5.8-fold increase in the cost of hospital care. I mean, to calculate it, around $3.4 million. That's a huge amount, you know. This study interestingly also showed that female patients and adolescent patients had increased rate of repeat hospitalization. In terms of gender demarcation, whether the rate of hospitalization was more for females versus male, they were not able to determine that. So. One could arguably put the case that was there increased risk of rate of hospitalization because of uh, increased ability to diagnose these patients or increased awareness, or was there increase in the severity of gastroparesis symptoms or both? It is kind of very, it's not exactly known whether that was the case. Now, whether this increased rate of hospitalization is due to increased incidence, we need more evidence-based and prospective studies. I hope this helps answer your question. It does. It tells me it's been increasing and whether there's been an increase recently, we can't answer. We need more data. Correct. Correct. Now, for our listeners, we should define gastroparesis so everyone knows what we're talking about. Uh, so, Viva, I'm going to read you a definition. Uh, the papers we we uh, you were kind of sending me some articles to read, and a lot of them had a similar definition. So, I'm going to read it, and you tell me if you agree. Gastroparesis is a debilitating illness characterized by delay transit of gastric contents in the du- in the duod into the duodenum in the absence of a mechanical obstruction. Does that sound an, like an appropriate definition? That sounds right about it. Yeah, it's remarkable. One of the things I learned in doing this work for this podcast is the differences in the adult and in the pediatric literature for gastroparesis. You brought up a little one when it came to uh, the gender differences uh, in the adult literature. It apparently is clear as day that this is a is an issue more predisposed to affecting women than men. But what I didn't know is the uh, so the just to just to give those numbers on the adult side, the incidence per hundred thousand from a study nineteen ninety six to two thousand, it was two point five in men, um, and then nine point eight in women for the incidence, and the prevalence was nine point six in men per hundred thousand, and thirty seven point eight in women. But that means on the adult side, it increased mortality and hospitalization costs, gastroparesis, which was new to me. I did not know that on the adult side, you have this increase in mortality and hospitalization. This was done out of a study in Olmstead, Minnesota, which is a ref- often referenced study. And am I right? In pediatrics, we've seen the increase in hospitalization costs, but we haven't seen the same type of mortality increase with gastroparesis that we see on the adult side. Is that a fair question? That That is a fair question and that's correct. So uh, again, I might be jumping ahead of the curve, but yes, definitely in terms of you know prognosis and outcome, the prognosis and outcome in pediatric patients with gastroparesis is not as gloomy as an adult side. And of course, you know, that uh, again brings us to the underlying etiopathological causes for gastroparesis in pediatric patient. Uh, Most of the time in pediatric patients, unlike adults, the causes are idiopathic. About 70% of the patients with gastroparesis have idiopathic causes. And if you were to further tease down the underlying etiology or underlying probable causes for idiopathic cases, 
approximately 25% of the patients who had the diagnosis of idiopathic gastroparesis, they had some kind of a viral illness uh, preceding to their clinical presentation, uh, which actually kind of is kind of good for us in the pediatric world because the outcomes for post-infectious uh, etiology for gastroparesis is much better as compared to uh, outcomes in adult patients with diabetes and other comorbidities. So on the pediatric side, when you get gastroparesis, is there data that tells us on average how long it lasts? On the adult side, I read it can be a year or even longer. On the pediatric side, do we have similar data that says if you get pediatric gastroparesis is most likely idiopathic, likely vir due to viral infection, it will typically last this amount of time? Correct. So again, the, uh, the information or data in pediatric gastroparesis is mostly from the retrospective studies. But okay. what we have realized uh, based on these retrospective studies, there was one retrospective study which kind of studied about 200 patients uh, of gastroparesis retrospectively. And out of those, 52% had complete resolution of the symptoms within a time frame of 12 months to 36 months. So that was, you know, kind of uh, the uh, observation that was gathered from that study. Interestingly, we also noticed ba based on that study that younger age, uh, especially children and infants, male gender, post-viral etiology, uh, and shorter duration of symptoms at the time of presentation, and favorable response to prokinetic medication and absence of other comorbidities such as other psychiatric disorder or other mental health, all these factors were actually associated with improved outcomes. Well, that sounds good. Yeah. Now, Viva, I was wondering, could we review the normal emptying of the, of the stomach? Because we're talking about abnormal emptying. I'm going to read you what I have written out, and then you, of course, as the expert, tell me where I'm wrong. For the normal emptying of gastric contents, I have that it involves complex and highly coordinated digestive processes controlled by intrinsic neurons and extrinsic input from the central and autonomic nervous system. And the important aspects of normal stomach emptying is the proximal stomach has accommodation, the antrum or the antral contracts, the pyloric sphincter relaxes, and then the antropyloric duodenal coordination of all these events. Is that an appropriate kind of summary of normal stomach emptying? I think you've just put it all very eloquently. Yes, that's just about it. I couldn't have put it in much nicer way, but yes, that's just about it. Um, well, you're welcome to rephrase it if you give it because I got this. I'll tell you where I got it from. The article's update on pediatric gastroparesis, a review of the published literature and recommendations for future research by Kovac, Kovac K, uh, Elfar W. Rosen et al. This was published in November 2019 in Neurogastroenterology and Motility. But if you if you can summarize it um, in a more understandable way for our audience, you feel free, Viva. No, absolutely. You know, I think the important aspect to know about the underlying normal physiology of gastric motility is uh, fundic relaxation and accommodation is an important aspect, uh, which kind of you know drives the bus for gastric emptying. Uh, and of course, as you put, uh, as you put it, um, it's a coordinated action between the fundus of the stomach, body of the stomach, and the antrum. And most of the time, the targeted treatment that we use is to help with the gastric accommodation, which is the fundal accommodation, and then antral contractions. And most of the, um, the pharmacological interventions that is being currently utilized is targeting those particular areas. And as we'll talk a little bit more about pharmacological interventions and some of the pharmacological agents, especially the prokinetics, um, that, that's the areas which is being targeted um, to treat gastric, delayed gastric emptying. So now, Viva, uh, we, we've talked a little about the, what the diagnosis is and, and incidence and prevalence. Uh, if I have a patient in front of me, uh, when should I be worried or consider gastroparesis? Very good question. So I think first and foremost, we start with our good old fashioned technique of, you know, what we learned in medical school, 
a good history taking and a good physical examination. I think half the challenge of diagnosing this patient is based on a good history taking. As we know, most of the pediatric patients, the presenting symptoms for delayed gastric emptying or to suspect whether there is, you know, gastroparesis is symptoms of nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. These are the most frequently reported symptoms for pediatric gastroparesis. And of course, sometimes these symptoms are not very specific and they might be an overlap with other functional gastrointestinal disorders such as functional dyspepsia or reflux. But however, most commonly, if you see a patient who's presenting with nausea, vomiting, early satiety, postprandial fullness, abdominal pain, you start thinking about, okay, are we dealing with you know, delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis symptoms here. Interestingly, again, based on these retrospective studies, we have seen that age also significantly influences the gastroparesis symptoms expression. Younger children and infants with most commonly will present with vomiting symptoms, whereas nausea and abdominal pain symptoms is going to be more uh, frequently seen in older children and adolescents. In addition to that, we know that when children, even adolescent and younger children, they experience nausea and vomiting symptoms, their appetite dose goes down. So it's also important to take into consideration any significant loss of appetite, any significant weight loss, and then malnutrition. And if they also have a comorbidity of diabetes, then you also have to take into consideration any fluctuation or unexplained fluctuation in the blood glucose levels or any electrolyte imbalances associated with nausea and vomiting. So when you put down the whole clinical picture together, then you are thinking, okay, we are you know, looking into uh, whether this is gastroparesis or any other GI disturbances. Then of course, you know, the going back to the definition, Gastroparesis is defined as delayed gastric emptying in absence of mechanical obstruction. So first thing, you know, to rule out is, is there any mechanical obstruction? So there comes our, you know, further workup, you know, to look for any anatomical causes. Is there any concerns for gastric outlet obstruction? Is there any concerns for any malrotation? So then comes the first you know, line of ruling out is with imaging studies. And we also now recommend doing endoscopies. So imaging would be to rule out any anatomical causes and endoscopy is to rule out any underlying mucosal causes because there are certain um, illnesses which are associated with delayed gastric emptying. For example, cow's milk protein allergy, which we you know see all the time. Interestingly, it has also been associated with delayed gastric emptying. So if you treat cow's milk protein allergy, you kind of also are resolving the symptoms of delayed gastric emptying. Untreated celiac disease is also associated with delayed gastric emptying. So it's important to rule out um, identifiable and treatable mucosal uh, or inflammatory causes. Then after you've ruled out any anatomical mucosal uh, pathologies and you are certain that there's no mechanical obstruction present, then comes the gold standard for diagnosing delayed gastric emptying. And again, most of the data in pediatrics is extrapolated from the adult studies. We don't have normative values for pediatric patients, but for now, the gold standard to diagnose delayed gastric emptying is what we call as a four hour solid um, meal test. And again, I'm not going to go into much details about it, but if you want me to, I'm happy to. But this is a nuclear medicine gastric emptying test, uh, which involves uh, utilizing technetium 99 labeled low fat uh, solid meal test. And then we have these normative values based uh, from adult studies. And what is important to realize is that some institutions, they do two hour study but some institution do four hour. However, according to the latest consensus from American Neurogastroenterology and Motility Society and American Nuclear Medicine Society, it is recommended that we should pursue the four hour solid meal test compared to two hours. Viva, I'm curious, uh, as an expert in the field, without normative data, how do you interpret a four-hour um, swallowing test, uh, a gastric emptying test? Uh, do you? How do you go about interpreting it? I just I've never seen a, a a 
gold standard like this where we don't have normative data in kids. So I'm very curious what, what you go through. Very good question. Uh, and again, we really don't have, as I said, normative values for pediatric patients. So uh, we kind of extrapolate from the adult studies. There have been few limited studies in pediatric patients where they have tried to obtain uh, normative values. But again, the number has been so small mm -hmm. and also the kind of a meal that is utilized because uh, it's very hard to uh, ask a six-year-old or an eight-year-old to have a standardized meal. In adults, it's very easy. Okay, you, you, you can have these eggs with toast and jam and water but many a times uh, our pediatric patients you know they do comply but sometimes they don't do a whole complete meal and then you have to yeah. then again take that into a perspective so i think that's where our uh, our uh, our skills as pediatrician comes in handy because then you have to put that into a clinical perspective so if your clinical presentation is kind of suggestive of gastroparesis and you kind of has, have this test, which is kind of giving you a rough value because uh, I'll give you an example. Suppose if I have a patient who is classic symptomatology is reflective of gastroparesis, they had a viral prodrome preceding this clinical presentation, and I order a gastric emptying study, which comes out as normal, I think as a clinician, I would still go ahead and presumptively treat that patient for gastroparesis rather than saying uh, everything is normal. I hope that helps. That does help. So you take the clinical picture, uh, like I would I would have assumed you would do that. You take the clinical picture into account. The other question, I want to get back to diagnosing this, but the, some patients that are more prone to getting gastroparesis, you mentioned celiac, you mentioned patients with diabetes and po of course post-viral. What I was surprised by was reading that children with uh, postural tachycardia syndrome or POTS and then collagen vascular disorders, muscular dystrophy and mitochondrial disorders are more prone to developing gastroparesis. And then critically ill patients can get it as well. Is that what you have seen in your experience? Yes, yes. So children with POTS, children with connective tissue disorders, children with the um, hypermobile EDS disorders, they tend to have delayed gastric emptying. Interestingly, one thing which I did not mention, giving the normative value. So we've always talked about delayed gastric emptying. There is also an entity called as accelerated gastric emptying, where in accelerated gastric emptying, the stomach will empty about 70% of the contents in the first hour, which is kind of is a definition of accelerated gastric emptying, again, based on the adult studies. And interestingly, we have seen children with connective tissue disorders, and if they have associated POT symptoms, and if they have associated hypermobility, they tend to present with accelerated gastric emptying. So to treat those patients with gastroparesis or treating those patients with prokinetic agents is actually kind of counterintuitive because you want to slow down their gastric emptying. But um, so that's again, something that we are learning from our experiences of doing gastric emptying studies in these patients. And if they have accelerated gastric emptying, then we have to change our treatment modality to slow down the emptying rather than putting them on medications which will promote gastric mortality. And then you talked about type 1 diabetes, but also Turner syndrome, pancreatic insufficiency, and cystic fibrosis are yeah. I have a higher risk of getting gastro. And then functional dyspepsia you talked about, but constipation was a surprise. Yes. If you're constipated, you can have gastroparesis as well. Yes, interestingly, the, uh, again, we found this called correlation. About 20% of the patients with constant constipation can have delayed gastric em emptying. And this is secondary to reflexive colonic inhibition of the upper GI motility. So many a times we see that uh, quite frequently in our clinical practice, especially young adolescent females, um, they're coming with constipation and they present with uh, associated upper GI symptoms of abdominal bloating, abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. And you know the first step then again should be to treat their constipation symptoms. And we have seen again, chronic intractable constipation and gastroparesis also go hand in hand. 
hand in hand. That's fascinating. So if I, if I understand what you're saying, if I have a patient that presents who has nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain are the most common symptoms, but can have bloating or early satiety, maybe even have some weight loss, I'm going to suspect gastroparesis. If they're, and I'm a pediatrician, so it's a pediatric patient. So I know my most common reason is idiopathic and post viral. So yes. I'm going to look for that in my history. And we've talked about the diagnostic testing, but it, 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 am I right? And at this point in pediatrics, uh, this is a fairly clinical diagnosis you would make based on the history of the patient and how they're presenting. Is that a, a correct thing to say? I would say, yes, that would be a correct thing because your clinical presentation will point you towards the diagnosis. And of course, we do tend to still use four hour solid phase gastric emptying study to still give us at least some idea because at least that is giving us some objective data. And especially for older adolescent patients, we can still use those normative values from the adults to give us a little bit more help in terms of defining. Okay, that sounds over. And then for the pathogenesis or pathophysiology, on the adult side, it's there. They believe this is the ICC cells or the and I'm and I'm forget. I didn't write this down. I'm forgetting what those cells are. Well, those you're are here. Interstitial cells of Kahal. I hope I'm uh-huh. pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate it. So they, on the pathogenesis side, on the adult side, they feel that those cells are intricately involved in the pathogenesis. And on the pediatric side, do we have an idea? Is it the same? Are we? Do we know the pathogenesis well? So unfortunately, again, the answer is no. Now, again, based on the adult studies, um, you know, they, they have done um, some translation studies and uh, as I mentioned, um, interstitial cells of Cajal, these are called as the pacemaker cells. Uh, these ICC cells are located in the gastric walls. And basically, these cells, they mediate enteric neurotransmission. They also help to generate the basal electrical rhythm in the stomach as well as in the small intestine. Based on that, the gastric motility is kind of driven. These ICC cells, they also mediate what we call as a neural input, and they are also mechanic mechanosensitive. So based on the histopathological specimens in adult studies, they found that when they did the electron microscopy in the histological specimens, there was loss of ICC cells in the myenteric plexus. And the proposed mechanism for adults is that it is probably there's some generalized inflammation and there is a macrophages driven loss or functional abnormalities in the ICC cells, which kind of leads to gastric dysmotility. Most of these specimens, again, were drawn from adult patients with a diagnosis of either idiopathic gastroparesis or diabetic gastroparesis. Uh, and again, they they showed that there was abnormal infiltrates, infiltrates uh, containing macrophages, uh, and, as well as the decrease in the nerve fibers. Now, whether these same pathophysiological findings are present in children, that is not known. We need to, you know, design more, you know, elaborative studies to um, look at the pathological or the histopathological specimens in children to really determine if that's true in children or not. That was fantastic. Thank you, Viva. Now, The other thing I read in the adult literature is this gastroparesis-like syndrome, GLS. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's become more of a thing. Can you talk about that a little? And and are we seeing that in pediatrics at all? I think, again, we have to put it in a clinical contrast. As you uh, you talked about, you know, the exact diagnosis of gastroparesis is difficult to establish. But these patients, pediatric patients, again, will present with overlapping GI disorders. So there is a almost 40 to 45% of the patients, there's a significant overlap between functional dyspepsia and gastroparesis. So clinically, if I'm seeing a patient in my clinic and then they are presenting with symptoms of nausea, vomiting, bloating, postprandial fullness, postprandial abdominal pain, there is a significant overlap between functional dyspepsia and gastroparesis. Only way I can differentiate between these two entities is based on abnormal gastric emptying study. So if they have a delayed gastric emptying, then I have a diagnosis of gastroparesis. But if they have normal gastric emptying, then I'll still 
put them into that category of functional dyspepsia. That was a fantastic the explanation. Treatment, I think the treatment for these patients is not a whole lot of different when we when when it comes to that. I hope that helps. That helps a lot. And it's actually a perfect segue because I was going to start asking about treatment because I, there's a lot of different things we can use. I would love to hear from your perspective as an expert, how do you decide what to start with, what to do first? If you have a patient in front of you, we've gone through who we would suspect. We've gone through diagnostic testing, but it's a clinical diagnosis still. And now we, we're suspecting and thinking this is gastroparesis. Again, in pediatrics, most likely idiopathic, most likely um, viral, post-viral. What would you, how would you decide what to treat with when? Okay, very good question. So I think, um, again, for the readers, if they really want to have this reference, there's a very nice flow sheet diagram on that paper that you just mentioned about Dr. Kowachik. But again, first aspect of treatment for pediatric patient is nutritional assessment. As we talked about, when they're having so much significant upper GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, definitely the nutrition has to give in. So first thing to start with, if you know this is a patient you're dealing with gastroparesis or functional dyspepsia, do a nutritional assessment. And that should be the first and foremost thing we should be treating as pediatrician. In addition to that, you know, in terms of treatment wise, uh, based on the adult studies, adult studies uh, do recommend dietary modification, the good old fashioned way of uh, gastroparesis diet, which involves utilizing low residue, low fat diet to, uh, in small frequent meals. So that is usually the you know, first step that we you know, uh, recommend for dietary modification. However, uh, we have again gathered from our data that dietary modification by itself is not sufficient in pediatric patients. It is a first-line treatment for both adults and children. But again, we know that uh, as a sole therapy, dietary modification in pediatric patients is not effective. Then we have to, you know, intervene with what we call as a pharmacotherapy intervention, which is often needed um, in addition to nutritional rehabilitation as well as the dietary modification. Can I ask you before you keep going? I never, I never understood the dietary intervention: low fat, low fiber. I understand the low fat. How does low fiber help? So low fiber is actually, I should put it more as low residue rather low than residue. Low fiber. Yes. I think you said that I said low fiber. You yes. said low residue. And uh, this will bring us back to our basics of, you know, how the solid meals and liquid meals, they empty from the stomach. So if you were to, you know, go back to our physiology, basic physiology, you know, lectures, when the liquids, they empty from the stomach, liquids have an exponential pattern of emptying, which is dependent both on the volume as well as the osmolarity of the liquid when it comes to emptying from the stomach. Whereas the solid emptying has an initial lag phase, which is followed by the linear pattern. So that's why they have a different mechanism of emptying. And one of the treatments that we use also for pediatric patients in terms of dietary modification is because we know that in gastroparesis, it's the solid phase which is affected more frequently than the liquid phase. So sometimes, you know, intervention with liquid diet as compared to solid meals is also recommended. Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you. All right. So then in terms of uh, pharmacologic, I had read we, we use erythromycin, metoclopramide, doperidone is sometimes used. Cisapride was mentioned, but is no longer used because of uh, issues with cardiac side effects. What do you like to use first? Well, how do you make that decision? When you have to use pharmacologic therapy, you've tried dietary interventions. As you said, that's usually not enough. How do you make the decision what medication to use? So I think the first decision is to start a prokinetic agent. Okay. And in terms of starting a prokinetic agents, again, there is not a whole lot available, even on the adult side, and much research now is being done to figure out the novel prokinetic agents. So the time-tested prokinetic agent that we have used, which has been in existence for last 50 years, is metoclopramide, which is a dopamine receptor antagonist. Metoclopramide has been in use for, I would say, 50 plus year. And till date, 
metoclopramide is the only FDA approved drug for treatment of gastroparesis. No, no other medication has been available in the market, even for the adult side. Okay. Um, so, however, that said, uh, you know, despite the fact that this is the only FDA approved drug, it still comes with a catch. In 2009, FDA actually issued a black box warning against the long-term use of metoclopramide, as well as you know, using the uh, higher cumulative dose, because uh, we know that metoclopramide is a dopamine receptor antagonist, which acts both centrally as well as the periphery. So centrally, when it acts, it crosses the blood-brain barrier, and thus it has increased the risk of extrapyramidal side effects, um, such as tremors, Parkinson's-like uh, symptoms, and again, the most dreaded side effect, we call it as a tardive dyskinesia, and that's the one which kind of, you know, brought in this uh, black box warning. Um, so that's one medication that we have. Having said that, again, there was one literature, which is, you know, uh, dopamine was a um, long time back before 2009, was used very frequently in infants. And actually it had good results in promoting gastric emptying and, you know, relieving gastroparesis symptoms. So, so right now, of course, this is the one drug that is available. And then the other dopamine receptor antagonist, which is not available in the United States, is domperidam, uh, again, because it was taken off the market because of the increased cardiac side effects. So we don't have the ability to use domperidam here in the US. So that's one. But in pediatric patients, the most commonly used prokinetic agent is motlin receptor agonist, which is erythromycin. It's a macrolide antibiotic. And the rationale for using erythromycin is uh, it acts on the motilin receptors in the antrum. And, and these motilin receptors, um, how it works is it kind of attaches to these motilin receptors and increases the antral contractions, as well as it regulates uh, what we call as a migrating motor complexes which is a kind of a, it's, it kind of promotes the contraction. So these are the housekeeping waves in the GI tract, which is responsible for the good health of the uh, intestinal housekeeping function. So these migrating motor complexes are responsible for the normal health of the GI tract. Uh, so it kind of promotes those uh, uh, migrating motor complexes. Uh, it's been widely used in pediatric patients and adults. And it also helps in improving the gastric emptying time as well as relieving the symptoms. Again, it's been in use uh, since 2004. Um, however, erythromycin comes with the catch. When this agent is used in low dose suspension, over the short term usage, it has dramatic improvement in the symptoms of gastroparesis. However, when you use it long term, long term usage does not give that many good results. And I think partly that could be explained because of the tachyphylaxis, because erythromycin, again, those motilin receptors, erythromycin has a tendency to develop tachyphylaxis. So that's why sometimes in our clinical practice, we use a concept of, call of what we call as a drug holiday, where we give the medication for 25 days and then we stop for five days. And the rationale of stopping the medications for five days is to reset the homeostasis of those receptors so that when you reintroduce the medication back, it kind of helps with the efficacy. And you'll keep these kids on these medicines until you f you figure as an on the outpatient side uh, that they've gotten through there if it's post-viral and then you can wean them off. Is that right? Correct. Correct. And again, as we have determined based on the outcomes uh, of these treatments, over the period of time, these patients will improve, unlike adults. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so, of course, clinically gauging them for their responses and then monitoring their symptoms. And at the same time, of course, you know, using the other ancillary measures. But of course, there is going to be a certain subset of patients who are going to be refractory to medical management. So then we have some other advanced techniques that we use uh, for medically refractory gastroparesis. Uh, so one of the things that we use is, again, extrapolated from the adult data. We use what we call as endoscopic uh, measures to take care of these patients. So these are called as, if I were to put it elegantly, that is called as a sphincter therapy because we know pylorus is you know, frequently involved in the gastroparesis part. So then we use what we call as a 
intrapyloric botulin injection that is performed endoscopically. Uh, and that has shown a promising result. And again, th- there are still, you know, uh, studies being done uh, in terms of, you know, the amount of dosage of botulin toxin that we can use. Um, historically, 100 units of botulin toxin injected intrapyloric followed by balloon dilation uh, can have efficacy for about three months time frame because the effect of the Botox wears over the period of time. So that's uh, one thing that we use. And I have I was reading, I was fascinated by two things. One, the NJ tube idea that sometimes you can just put a tube in past the stomach, into the jejunum, and feed that way. It seems short-sighted because how long are you going to do that for? But do you use that for very difficult patients, or do you use that for, if you were to use an NJ, how how and when would you decide to try that? So if I see a patient who is nutritionally compromised and where I'm concerned about the nutritional rehabilitation aspect, uh, and these patients are, Uh, refractory to medical management, and they're not responding to pharmacological interventions. Those are the patients I would think about uh, doing a short-term NJ or transpyloric feed, because again, we've kind of determined that the problem lies in the pylorus and the antrum. But at the same time, once we take away the, the dynamics of feeding them into the stomach and, you know, coming across challenges of feeding them and keeping their nutrition intact. I think the approach should also be simultaneously, again, to use intervention, which would rehabilitate their antral dysfunction and pyloric dysfunction. So those are the patients, if I were to decide, feeding them through the either via NJ tube or um, I would hate to, you know, put the patient to a trauma of surgical intervention such as gastrojejunostomy or jejunostomy tubids, they are, going, they, are, they are again going to be a certain subset of patients, very few who would need that. But then a goal, goal should be to uh, treat them. And again, at the same time, education that we know with our experience that most of these patients are idiopathic etiology and over the period of time, they will improve. Now, the other treat, thank you, this has been wonderful so far. The, the other treatment I was, it was I had never heard of and I was interested in is the gastric electric stimulators. And this is a device implanted directly in the stomach. It almost reminds me of a pacemaker for the for the stomach. It, they use it in resistant idiopathic gastroparesis or diabetic gastroparesis. It's more used on the adult side from what I read. And on the adult side, it decreases morbid, morbidity even 10 years out. Is this something you're using or consider for very resistant gastroparesis in patients? Correct, yes. So again, these are the newer um, diagnostic modalities that we are using now for refractory patients with gastroparesis. So neuromodulation or gastric electric stimulation, basically it utilizes high frequency, low amplitude, you know, device. It's, um, you know, it's an implantable device. And the exact mechanism of how this gastric pacer work is still not known. However, there is hypothesis that these gastric electric pacers, it stimulates the enteric nervous system to improve the gastric accommodation. And yeah. also it may have some central nervous system effect, which is mediated by the vagal nerve symptoms. So these gastric electric pacer devices actually have been very effective in improving the refractory nausea and vomiting symptoms associated with gastric pacers. So it may not, so if a patient has delayed gastric emptying, it may not affect the gastric emptying rate. However, the symptoms due to delayed gastric emptying, such as nausea and vomiting, this device is very effective in relieving those symptoms. That is fa- So if I understand this right, we have talked about what gastroparesis is, the f- definition, a little bit about prevalence and incidence and the lack of data for that in pediatrics really in terms of the history what to look for and that's abdominal pain nausea vomiting and then that's the most common then of course bloating uh, etc and then diagnostic testing uh what what's recommended what the data shows about it 
And then treatment. We've talked about our prokinetic agents, metoclopramide and erythromycin in the U.S., the four to six meals per day, low fat, low, fat, low fiber, smaller meals, how liquid meals uh, work differently and sometimes are used uh, for pediatric patients. And then for more resistant cases, what's done, NJ2 post-pyloric feeds and or gastric electric stimulators. That's everything I had. Uh, Viva, is there anything you want to talk about that I didn't bring up? So I would like to talk about, um, other than gastric electric stimulation, I would talk about another uh, gast uh, surgical intervention, which is, again, is a new kid on the block. Have you heard of gastric poem procedure or a gastric per oral endoscopic myotomy, G-poem? Um, so I have. I remember reading about the myotomy. Yeah. I'd love to hear more about it. So again, this is... Uh, a, is not again widely studied in pediatric patients, but mostly in adults. So this is a, again a very elegant procedure, which is done endoscopically. And how it's done is endoscopically, a surgeon goes in and creates a tunnel, and basically it's kind of a palaromyotomy minus the external surgical intervention. So so far, you know, uh, they have um, they're still you know recording the outcomes of G point procedure, and again, G point procedure again has been reserved for patients with refractory gastroparesis. And so far, about ten studies have been done, and the clinical success at one year for a G-point procedure was about 61%, uh, with adverse event uh, ranging from six to 8%. So this G-point procedure, again, was associated with a modest clinical success. And of course, more work is still being done um, to determine whether this is going to be, again, the new modality. Other additional things which you know people are doing in adult world is using the end of flip with G prime. So because then you we really don't know how much myotomy should a surgeon be doing. So we have this new tool which is the end of flip methodology, which kind of gives you a good idea about the cross sectional diameter as well as the pressure across the pylorus, and which helps the surgeon determine how much myotomy the they need to do. And so if if I'm a pediatric hospitalist and I have a very resistant uh, gastroparesis patient, before I get to the point where I'm calling the surgeon, I would clearly call someone like you from pediatric GI if I work in a place that's available uh, to evaluate the patient and see if they agree. Does that sound fair? That's That sounds very fair. Yes. I think by the time you come to this stage, I think then it's it's very essential that these patients are adequately referred to see a GI specialist who has the knowledge of you know doing these testing and also institutions because not all institutions have um, the availability of these advanced techniques and of course you also need an expert who is well versed in um, performing these diagnostic evaluation as well as interpreting these diagnostic evaluations. And with the rise, Viba, in kid, with the increase in kids who are uh, neurodevastated or have electronic devices, as we are getting better in pediatrics and kids are living longer with conditions that used to kill them, uh, it is safe to say we will see more gastroparesis because those children with multiple congenital issues from either HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, or something else, if they're living longer, this is they're at an increased risk of developing this. So we should uh, see these in these more, we could see these in these more complex patients. And am I right? If you have a patient who's nonverbal, non-communicative, they're even harder to diagnose this in. Is that fair to say? Very fair to say. And uh, yes, and you're right, as we are, you know, beginning to see more complex children with neurological uh, disorders and neurological devastation, it's very likely. And as we talked about a little bit in the etiology, that critically ill children, you know, especially when they are compensated uh, respiratory wise and GI symptoms wise, it's important to think that they will have some element of delayed gastric emptying. So. And the only thing we didn't mention for children, we're seeing more children, unfortunately, with eating disorders. And those children do tend to have some gastroparesis from what I read, but as they refeed, that tends to resolve. Is that is that uh, fair to say? 
Yes, that's very interesting phenomena that we have seen in especially in young um, females. So if you see a young female who's uh, presenting with uh, significant vomiting syndrome, uh, vomiting, sorry, vomiting symptoms, and you are suspecting an eating disorder, uh, it's very essential to you know, keep that you know, other ancillary diagnosis in mind. And um, especially patients with anor anorexia nervosa, we've seen that they have reduced postprandial glucose levels, which is also correlated with delayed gastric emptying. Um, and uh, we have seen that you know, these patients are very amenable to nutritional rehabilitation. Uh, because once you start rehabilitating these patients nutritionally, their gastric emptying actually tends to normalize. Fiba, I have learned so much. Thank you so much. This has been incredible. Is there anything more we didn't talk about? No, I think we've touched uh, pretty much everything. And and I enjoyed talking about this with you because, you know, I read about it, but it's uh, this discussion and um walking through this step-by-step -step approach has been very, you know, informative for me too. So yeah, I, I, you know, I learned when I, when I talk and discuss more about these kind of disorders, I, I think it's a good learning opportunity even for me. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Well, I thank you for coming. I can't thank you enough. We've learned a ton. We've enjoyed it. And if we have more of these motility disorders, can I give you a call, bring you back on the show? Absolutely. I would love to be back here again. It's It's been such a fun um, process. So um, yes, absolutely. Thank you again for having me. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Time for our acknowledgements. I want to thank our special guest again. I really do appreciate your time. I want to, as always, thank the UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and specifically the Paul C. Gaffney Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine for continuing to support the podcast. I want to take the time to remind our listeners that there is CME associated with most of our podcast episodes, courtesy of the University of Pittsburgh. So thank you, University of Pittsburgh. Please just click on the link at the bottom of the podcast, takes you to a web page, create a free username and password, answer some questions that I write that are not hard, and that's it. You get AMA Category 1 CME credit. I want to, as always, thank and acknowledge Dr. Megan Keen Tarchichi, who helps me with everything. But I really want to thank you all who are listening. Thank you for letting me uh, come into your earbuds or your car, wherever it is you are. I really appreciate the fact that you do that. Uh, if there's anything you want to hear or think we can cover better, any comments, suggestions, compliments, whatever you want to do, again, as always, please feel free to email me at Tony, T-O-N-Y, dot Tarchichi, T-A-R-C-H-I-C-H-I, at chp.com. Thank you again, everybody. Hope you have a great day. We'll see you next time.